Welcome to Toyota Time with Timmy the Tool Man and Sean. Today we are back at the East Coast Gear Supply facility to film another video for you. The re-gearing and locker install on the front 7.5 inch clamshell differential on my 98 Forerunner. For this video, the concentration is going to be on the install of the Eaton Locker, which is also known as Harrop. In the video, you're going to hear Chase calling it a Harrop. Harrop and Eaton joined together to make these e-lockers, and so they're pretty much synonymous. So if you hear us say Harrop or Eaton, it's the same thing. Chase is going to concentrate on all the intricacies of properly getting the Eaton e-locker installed in a 7.5 inch clamshell differential. Since Chase did a really complete job explaining the process how to rebuild and re-gear the rear 8 inch differential. He didn't feel it was necessary to reinvent the wheel and cover the same things he covered in that video. For this video he's not going to go over explaining how to set pinion bearing preload. He's not going to show pulling off and pressing on the carrier bearings. He's not going to show removing the ring gear and the tricks to getting the new ring gear on. Watch that rear differential rebuild re-gear video before watching this video. So your foundation for doing differential work is that rear differential video. So if you click on the link above, you can watch that video and get a good foundation and understanding of the process before watching this video. I highly recommend that you watch it so you'll better understand what's going on with this video. Chase is gonna do an excellent job in this video explaining all the necessary details to properly installing an Eaton e-locker into one of these clamshells. You're gonna walk away with a very good understanding of how to do the e-locker install if you choose to do this job yourself. So let's get back to the East Coast Gear Supply facility and let's get started with this job. All right, we're back at the East Coast Gear Supply facility and we're lucky enough to have Chase Perry, the CEO, once again to do the work. So we're gonna rebuild my front clamshell differential, which is gonna include the installation of a Harrop e-logger. Let's get started. All right, so this is seven and a half clamshells, what we call it clamshell because it's a clam design. Carrier bearings are fully encased in the casting. So we're gonna show taking it apart and then kind of the idiosyncrasies of the Harrop e-locker. If you're gonna start on a diff and how to learn to build a diff, doing a front clamshell with a Harrop e-locker is not the one you wanna start with. So you definitely wanna be very comfortable with ring and pinion, bearing, and moving shims around and those sort of things before you get involved in a Harrop e-locker install and a clamshell front, but we'll show you pretty in depth about the Harrop and what you need to do to make sure that you don't damage the unit. Sorry about the rest of the noise. We are in a production environment and we are building actual so. Yeah. But we'll start to tear it apart now and we'll separate it and knock it apart and show you what we got going on. I love these units because they're very strong, but it is a little bit more difficult to work on. You have to knock the races out to reshim it. You've got to put it together, take it apart a million times, especially when you're going to an aftermarket locker that maybe is a little bit different. Or if you're doing an ARB in one of these, very similar. There's a lot of things that have to change to make these lockers go in and be right. And being that they're so expensive, you don't want to damage the locker that you're putting in before you can even get to using it. So the rear diff with side adjusters is really a great diff to start with while you're learning on how to set back glass and look at patterns and that sort of stuff because it's just a lot easier to adjust them. Because it's a clamshell design, they're very strong because you're supporting the carrier all the way around and you're tying this thing together. Whereas when you think about that rear dropout, you know, it's wide open and all you have is the housing for support. Whereas this is the whole casting supports it. They are very strong design, high pinion, a great little bit. So, all right, let's get started. Got it on a stand here. I can show you the mounting. This is the same bolt holes that you would mount into the vehicle. So this is the same fixture we are using for the rear. 
just loosen it up and adjust it a little bit. I had to modify these holes to make them big enough. But this way you've got it at a good working height because you do need to flip this thing around as you're going through the process. So we're just going to take the case half bolts out, which are 14 millimeters, and then there's dowels right here. So you've got a dowel here and a dowel here, and that's what holds this thing together. So you just pop the bolts out. Uh, so I'm going to use the air hammer because it's caught on the dowels, it doesn't come off. You can obviously use a drift or whatever, but there's little tabs. If you see these flat spots here, uh, there's little spots where you can knock it apart. And I suppose if you didn't have an air hammer, you could just use a brass drift with a hammer and hit those tab points and just pop Correct. it up, right? And where you're hitting is not on any of the seal surfaces, so you don't really have to worry about damaging anything. We'll talk about it when we go to reseal this thing, but um, these are very easy to seal and they don't leak. So our case half is off. You set it over there. You just reach in and pull your carrier out. So the good thing about this is, is I've got the carrier out. None of my shimming has changed because the shim is right here underneath this race. So once you have it right, everything stays together and it's pretty easy to take them apart, put them back together if you're not changing shim. So we're gonna just pop the pinion nut off, 24 millimeter. We'll go ahead and air hammer the uh, pinion out. There's your crush lead. Same with the rear differential we did yesterday. The pinion shim is right underneath the pinion bearing. So to adjust pinion depth, you're gonna shim it right underneath the bearing, just like we did on the rear. All right, so same as the rear on the pinion seal here. Notice how recessed the pinion seal is. So this is a huge common mistake that we see is people leave this seal flush with the casting, but you can see this rust line. This thing is highly inset. And I just placed the yoke back in here. Look where that dust shield is right here. It's inboard of that casting. So if you leave this pinion seal flush, this tin dust sleeve will run into it and it'll give you false preload. So people think that when they're putting the pinion together and they're tightening up the nut, that they have bearing preload, but they don't. This is just riding against that pinion seal. So you go drive it and then the pinion will beat the seal in further and your pinion will get very loose. And I've seen them lock up because of that. We'll have the diff come in when the pinion is locked up and broken. We pop the yoke off and here's the pinion seal flush. So measure this depth or you can even just look for the rust line and make sure you're seating that pinion seal correctly so that you don't have an interference problem there. So same as on the rear end with the pinion seal, I don't like to use a seal puller because I'm worried about dragging the surface. And also this is a high pinion differential. So in the orientation, this is the bottom. So I always like to stay away from the bottom, right? Because that's where oil is always gonna stay. So I'm gonna come up here on the high side and I'm gonna knock it inboard. And that's gonna loosen it up. So I can just reach in there and pull it out by hand. And now I've got a perfect surface that there's no damage to. All right, so we got pinion out, carriers out, and you can see the races in here. Here's your inner race and your outer. Just take your drift and drive those out from both sides, just like we did on the rear. And make sure you don't drag surfaces or damage those race seats. I'm not gonna knock these out because there's nothing to it. Just take your uh, drift and knock it out. I will say putting these races back in can be a challenge if you don't use heat. So there's not a lot of room to get in here and really drive those. So we do put these in our parts washer and let them get nice and warm and then we'll freeze the races and then you can almost drop them in. It just makes it very easy to just tap them in and you don't have to use a lot of force. So if you're doing it at home and obviously you don't have a hot parts washer, 
you know, you can put it in the oven similar to the ring gear, 350 degrees for five, 10 minutes, put a set of gloves on and those races will go right in. All right, so I'm just gonna flip it over so I can get to the other side. This would be your driver's side and this seal is covering the shim and the race or access to it. So we have to knock it out so this one, I'm gonna beat down again to loosen it, but there's not as much leeway for you to knock it in, so it actually won't come all the way out. So you do have to use a seal puller, but when you knock it in like that, you do lose some of its press efficiency. And when I do use a seal puller, I'm very careful that I'm hooked on the inside of the seal and I'm not dragging that surface. So if you look down in that groove, my tool never touched this surface because again, if you drag this, create a groove, oil wants to leak around it. So we were very careful to protect that. Here's the shim. The race is just behind it. We were looking at it here on the shallow case half. Here's the opposite side, shim, race. So we're looking at both of these now and we have to drive it out. Just a little aluminum puck that fits down in here. You can drive it out with the drift, but if you do, you're gonna damage the shim. Also, as you can see, there's not much of the race that is sticking out past the casting. So if you use a puck that's too small, you'll concave that shim and then you'll need to flatten it out or it can mess with your backlash. So you do really want to use a puck that fits nice and snug in here. So you're putting force against the race and not just the shim because you'll ultimately damage the shim. So this is just a universal aluminum driver set. It is not correct. We didn't make this specifically to fit perfectly. So there's your shim and there's your race. And we can knock out the other side on that shallow half. You wanna keep these separated and know which side is which and measure them and make sure you're keeping them because this is what's gonna control your backlash. So if we want uh, less backlash, we're going to increase the thickness of this shim to move the ring gear closer to the pinion. Uh, if we wanna keep the preload the same, then we're gonna take the exact opposite amount out of the deep side. So that's how we're gonna close the backlash. I will say, although we're doing this for representation of taking it apart, when you're doing a hair up or any kind of uh, carrier swap, it's a really good idea to just leave the bearings alone if you're using the exact same carrier bearing on the carrier. If you're gonna use new bearings, then go ahead and just leave the stock shim in its location, put a new race back in and mount your carrier bearings to the e-locker or the ARB and just put the unit in it without a pinion in it so you can see what's going on. Don't mount a ring gear to it. This will just get you a feel for that carrier in the clamshell where you have a better feel for what's going on and there's not a lot of interference. <laughs> All right, this is our seven and a half e-locker. The magnet comes separate in the box in this plastic bag. The reason why they do that is because you can't fit the ring gear over the magnet. So you have to mount the ring gear, then put the magnet on it. As I was just saying, if you've never done an e-locker before and you're not familiar with what's going on, it's a really good idea to go ahead and put the magnet on the unit, which means you're gonna have to press the carrier bearing on after the magnet goes on because the carrier bearing is what holds it on and then you'll have to remove that carrier bearing later, pull the magnet off, and then mount the ring gear. I'm gonna do that so I can show you on video what's happening, and it's a lot easier to see what's happening when you don't have a pinion in it and when you don't have a ring gear mounted to it. So it's real critical to get this thing in the right orientation and know what you're doing before getting started because you can damage this magnet there's got to be some clearancing done in the housing. So it comes in this plastic bag and the locking pins are loose. I don't know if you can see it on the video, but there's a flat side and then a dome side. 
the dome side is going to face up. So you got your three locking pins sticking out and then they've got the magnet zip tied together. If you see these ramps here, those pins ride in this groove and that's how it locks. It rides up the ramp and pushes these pins down and it slides the locking gear over. The world's dullest knife. The ramps aren't the same. So you rotate it until it's in place. See, that doesn't line up correctly. So you line it up so that the pins are aligned in these ramps and that's the correct orientation. There is a shim here on top and this is a plate that actually holds the magnet and then there's also a needle bearing thrust washer. So here's all your pieces. This is your action plate is what I call it that has the ramp. So if this thing gets separated, here's the order. Action plate, small thrust washer, needle bearing, actual magnet. This is what's energized by the electricity and creates the magnetic force. And then we have the plate that rides on top of the needle bearing. And then here's a small shim that aligns it. This shim is actually a press fit. As you can see, it doesn't want to sit all the way down. Well, when we press our carrier bearing on, this shim will press down and it'll lock all this together. I went ahead and put on the carrier bearing. So I've got this magnet now locked in because the carrier bearing is holding it. Now, Tim and I were talking off camera because I've done it this way, in order to mount the ring gear, I'm gonna have to remove this bearing and you are gonna need one of the clamshell style bearing pullers to get this bearing off without damaging it or damaging anything else. The only reason why this is a necessity is it'll get you comfortable getting this carrier in there and you can see what's happening. So once you get comfortable, you don't need to do this anymore because you have a better understanding of what's happening. Maybe by watching this video, you don't think you need to do this because we've shown you what you need to grind clearance and where to put the hole. So hopefully by this video, you won't have to do it this way, but we are so we can get a better look at what's going on. So I've got my shim back in the case half, same one that came out of it. I just knocked them out for visual purposes, but now we're gonna knock them back in so that you can see the process. So our race is installed. You want to check your shim underneath here and make sure that it's not spinning. We actually like to do a final press on these or press these in usually. You can beat them in like I just did and you just want to check the shim. But sometimes when you beat these in, the race will actually want to try to bounce up and leave this shim loose. You have to be very careful on ARBs if you're driving the races in, that seal housing isn't spinning. So shim is locked in place, it's fully seated. Uh, now I'm driving in the deep case half side. Shim's tight. So if you guys come around here, you can kind of see both of these. Because of the magnet profile, if you look at the profile, this square edge, it won't clear the webbing in the casting. So we have pre-ground it on this unit here. And if you look in on this unit, you can see the two webs side by side. So if you try to put the e-locker in here, it's going to run into this and you're gonna bend or damage that magnet. And the case halves aren't gonna wanna close up because your carrier bearing won't seat in the race until you clearance this. So I'm gonna clearance these real quick so that we can drop the carrier in there and we can look inside from both ways. Hopefully we can get a good look at it on camera. All right, so we're gonna grind the web on here. We've got an abrasive disc on a die grinder. Right angle is the easiest. They're a little bit difficult to get to, but.
All right, so I've went in and I've ground it. And the reason why this is important, I feel like to put the carrier in without the pinion in first is to make sure that we're not binding here. If I haven't ground enough, it's a lot easier to tell what's going on if I just put the carrier in. If you look at the e-locker, these tabs are the anti-rotation tabs. And these anti-rotation tabs split this oil drain boss in the housing. So as you're dropping this in, you're making sure that those tabs are on the correct side of it. So again, because I can wrap my fingers around the carrier, it makes it really easy to drop it in. Now with the ring gear off, I can see exactly what's happening with the wire. I can see down in there where that magnet is and that it appears to be rotating freely. There's no interference. See the anti-rotation tabs are bouncing back and forth. So as you drive, when you apply the electronic force to the magnet, it locks it up. Are those color coded for which positive nigger? No. You can do either one? Yeah. Okay. Well, it was kind of cool because you heard it lock. Did yeah. you hear that yeah. sound? Yeah. I don't know if we'll catch that on video. But so we've got 12 volts applied to it through the battery box. And now if you look down at those pins, how now it's trying to ride up the ramp. You do need axle input force to really create, I guess, the feedback so that the carrier will rotate past the ramp plates. Otherwise, it'll just try to slip the magnet. You also need some axle input because the internal gears have to line up. So if they're not perfectly aligned, there's got to be some bit of rotation so that the action can happen and the splines can line up. So right now it is locked in. The anti-rotation tabs are banging against our casting there. And that's what's going to hold the magnet in place so that those pins will ride up on the ramp and then move the gear internally to lock it in place. We'll just unhook it. And now you can see it spins nice and free. And this would be the open scenario where just your spider gears are working. So now we have the electrical wires. Tim mentioned, I don't know if we were on camera or off camera, but I just hooked up the leads. There's not a positive and negative. It's a magnet. So it doesn't matter which side is ground or positive. You just need ground and positive and it works. We do have the battery box here and any e-locker we ever put in, we test them almost immediately because if you have a problem, maybe the wire got damaged in shipping or the magnet is bad or whatever it is, it's rare. But if you do this whole assembly, you swap it back into the vehicle and there's an electronic problem with the wires, you're gonna be dramatically upset yeah. uh, that you have to tear it all the way back apart. This is sitting down in the carrier bearing race and this is its resting position. Now granted, we don't have the top cap on that is applying pressure, but we know we have clearance because we ground our webs there. And now because the ring gear is not on here, I can see where I can place the hole in the casting to mate it. Now, I will say you have to mount it low enough to get away from the ring gear, which 410 ring gear is not as thick as say a 529. So if you're putting a 529 ring gear on here, the pinion is gonna get smaller, the ring gear is gonna get a lot thicker. So you need to be careful that you do drill this hole away from the ring gear that's not pictured here. But again, once the ring gear is on here, you can't see anything. So this is just giving you a good judge of where you're gonna put this wire. Now again, keep in mind, this is a high pinion differential and we want it on the high side of the differential. You don't wanna drill it over here on the bottom where oil's sitting on this rubber grommet for years and years. We want it outside of the oil bath if possible, which it is in this case. Depending on how you're looking at the differential, we'll call this oil drain, which is on the bottom of the diff, we'll call that the 12 o'clock position because that's where I'm standing. The oil drain is at 12 o'clock. You're gonna move down and you're gonna come over and it's right about the seven o'clock position that we like to put them in. You can see that you've got enough wire. I've already pre-drilled this one so we can see it and this gives you 
a good range. Here's oil drain, 12 o'clock, six and a half o'clock. You kind of have to get the feel for it. See this boss here, and you can see just to the left of it is a good position. I can grab a tape measure and we can show on video generally about where this location is. But again, just above this boss right here is a good position. Tim was saying off video, which is a good point. If you look at this indention in the casting, the top of this hole is very close to the top of that. So anywhere in about this general vicinity right here is a pretty good spot for them. You don't want to go too far this direction because your wire won't stretch to get into position. I'm sure Harrop has pictures in their instructions too. So what do you say though? That was probably like maybe like a little over an inch from the edge of that indentation. Here's our case half bolts that I had sitting there. So if you sit that in the groove, that's almost perfect. I would almost shift this hole just a touch to the end. So you could take your paint pen, make a mark right there. I've got the bolt head sitting right there in the groove. That's like the perfect measurement. Just go ahead and put you a punch mark there or a paint pen and you can drill it right there. All right, so pull your carrier bearing back off if you did it the way we did. Put your magnet back on. Now go ahead and mount your ring gear. I'm still not gonna put the pinion in it because I still wanna really pay attention to what's happening before I go ahead and drill that hole in this casting because you don't wanna buy a new casting. So now that the ring gear's on it, there's a lot less space to deal with. And this wire is going to want to be pushing this around. So you got to really pay attention when you're going in that those anti-rotation tabs are in the correct spot. You can't see through the pinion and all you can get to through that drain hole is the ring gear. So you can kind of ease it up and kind of double check and I can see down in there. Yeah, you, you can see the tab on either side of the drain hole. All right, so she's dropped in. But now, as you can see, with the ring gear in there, you're blind. You can't see the wires at all. So then you can kind of try to rock it back up this way. And at least this is the position that it's going to be in. You can see that boss again right there. And that's why we're putting the wire there. So using this trick that we just learned here in the last five minutes, you can take this case half bolt and leave it in that little groove. And now I'm just gonna take my paint pen and I'm gonna mark it right there because I feel real comfortable about that location. So I've got a little yellow mark. You can take a punch and go ahead and knock it. You can drill it from the inside if you want or if you feel comfortable spinning around drilling it from the outside. I believe the hair Eaton instructions tell you a half inch, but we think that's a touch too big for the grommet. And we like to go one step down to a 3164th drill bit. We got our hole drilled and now we're going to drop it in for real. We've got our pinion on it. We've actually already put paint on it so that we can run a pattern on it too. We got to do the same thing. This time, because we're going to be rotating the diff, we do need to have the wires through the hole so they're out of the way and it doesn't get caught in the ring gear when we're doing some rotation. We're not going to put the grommet all the way in because it's a real hassle to get back out. So now we got our carrier in there. Our wires are loosely in there just so it doesn't get caught in the ring gear. And now we're gonna put our case half on. Uh, again, there's the two dowels here quick reference point when you're putting this on high pinions on top our oil drains down here here's our vent the vents obviously on the top side so when you're going to line it up point your vent towards the top and that way you're not trying to figure out where it's going so then you just kind of strike it down onto the dowel make sure you rotate your pinion make sure everything's seated good And now that she's pretty much closed up, you can put your case half bolts in it. If I'm just doing initial setup, I usually don't put all the bolts in. I just put a few around 
so we know we're closing it up and we can get a look at the pattern. I do like to spin the pinion. I know I'm good at this point. Nothing's locked up. There's nothing crazy going on. But because I can't see anything, as I'm tightening this, I'm just gonna be rotating the pinion, paying attention. Like I can feel we got a little backlash. Everything's spinning free. I got no problems. And I'm going real slow, right? Squeezing this thing down, making sure that I'm not like jamming something because if you just run these bolts in and something's off, the gear's not lined up perfect, maybe uh, one of those anti-rotation tabs was actually caught wrong and this thing starts to bind, if you just slam this thing together real quick, you're gonna damage something. So as long as this pin is rotating and everything feels nice and smooth, then I know I'm good. So now I'll start to put torque and everything feels real good. So with the hair up, if you can look down in there, you can see that it has a four way cross pin, which is really strong, but kind of makes it difficult for us to run a pattern. So we've got this tool that usually will lock around an ARB or a stock open differential or something else. It'll go in there, but because the hair up has this four way, it won't work. It'll still engage, but to actually get it to spin, I'm gonna have to lock it in. Otherwise, we would just be rotating the spider gear and we're not going to get any pressure. Here it is, but that's just spinning the spider gear, so we will have to lock it in. If you heard the click on video, that's it locked in. Now, you'll notice, even though it clicked, it's still not rotating the diff. You've actually got to put some input force into it before it locks in. So you just put a little resistance on the pinion to get that to lock in? Correct. What happened as we were watching it, magnet has to stay still and then it's got to ride up that ramp plate to lock it in. So you've got to actually hold the pinion to get it to lock in. Now, when I back up, if I back up slow, it'll unlock. Uh, see how it just unlocks? So again, I've got to put some pressure on the pinion to get it to lock back. Everybody needs a hand dyno. It's like you're churning butter. See, and if I back up, it just unlocks. All right. So if somebody were going to do that without that special tool, how would they do it? You can turn the pinion and you can try to put some resistance, stuff a broomstick down there or something, I don't know, to try to get a little resistance. Or, I mean, you could just turn the pinion, which I'm not going to because I want my pattern to be what my pattern was with that resistance. But you can turn the pinion and it will give you some pattern, obviously, but it's really not going to give you the full story of the pattern that we like to see that we can really make a good determination on what's happening. I will mention checking backlash on these differentials is a little bit of a chore and I have not done that yet. I've been doing this a very long time. I know that it has backlash. It feels good to me and I'm just running patterns. So once I'm really getting into the final assembly and we'll get into that later, you have to flip the diff over and check it from the other side. If you're comfortable with what you're doing, you can kind of get through the process by making sure, yes, we have backlash and then start a verification process. But that's also where being very comfortable with what you're doing helps on speed. Otherwise, you're flipping this thing back over, checking backlash, adjustments, etc., etc. So I'll pop this thing back apart and we'll check the pattern. Again, these are a little tricky to grab because you don't have much to hold on to. So we've got a very nice clear picture. This pattern is a little deep, kind of have a dynamic edge down in the root on both sides. Because it's a high pinion, this is still the drive side here. If this was a low pinion, it would actually not be the drive side. But this is the strong side of the gear, which is why you want a high pinion. 
in your front differential. So this pattern is a touch deep. So what we do is pop the pinion out and I would take two thousandths out of that and I would guess that you would have a pretty perfect picture. So you would have to take two thousandths out of the shim that's underneath the pinion bearing, correct? Correct. So I'm gonna take pinion nut back off, take the yoke off, knock the pinion out, pull the bearing, make a two thousandths pinion shim adjustment, and then we'll go back together. Again, that's why I wasn't all that concerned with checking backlash and stuff because you really need to get in the general vicinity, which this is in the general vicinity for sure. It's not correct, it's not right yet, but as long as my backlash is within range in that like six to 10, it's not gonna mess with my pattern very much and I can continue on. So what I would do next is go ahead and make a 2000 pin and shim adjustment. And I would then check backlash because I feel real good about where we are and then run another pattern. This is where that special Yukon tool comes into play that you could cleanly take off that yep. pinion bearing without damaging it and then be able to press it on and you didn't waste the bearing. Correct. Yep. Okay. So what Chase is gonna do is he's gonna use this special tool again made by Yukon. He's gonna get a bearing race on here, put the cups around it, and then pull off the pinion bearing, and then make the shim adjustment. He said 2,000 difference, and then press the bearing back on. So I put the pinion nut on there just because I like to protect these threads. This is the pinion we're gonna be putting back in. And so I just like to be real careful that I don't wanna damage these. So it doesn't hurt anything to just screw the pinion nut on there just in case it pushes too hard, damages the thread, etc. It usually doesn't. So we're talking about this tool. There's different size cutouts depending on which way you flip them. And so you've got one size, two size, three size, four size. So you have four different combinations with these clamshells on what's gonna fit and let's see. So that one is too big. I'm trying to do it upside down, which is a little difficult. So this is kind of what I was talking about yesterday. If you look close here, so here's the cage, which is what the tool is kind of designed to grab around. But because this shim is so thick underneath, this is the inner race, which ideally is what you want to pull against. I don't think I'm gonna be able to catch just the inner race with the sizes here. This one might, we'll try it. You don't have to pull against that inner race. You can pull against the cage. That's what the tool is designed for. But if you don't have to put any pressure on the cage, don't. So this is just gonna grab the bottom lip of that actual bearing race. I'm concerned that it will slip off, at which point I'll need to take it apart and pay attention because then it'll be sloppy to my cage because I've got this clamshell drop down well below the cage. And if it pops up over that bearing race, then it's going to be sloppy and I'll just have to go back and tighten it up. But we'll see what happens. So before I back it up, the shim's actually stuck to it, but as you can see, it was actually catching on the bearing, not the cage. So not exactly how the tool's designed, but that's actually way better because you're not putting any pressure on the cage. So bearing's off. All right, so we have uh, about a 78, 79 in the diff, 79. So 77, 76, somewhere in that range. So the thickness of the shim that was underneath that pinion bearing was 79 thousandths. And so he's taking some measurements with a micrometer and he's gonna build a shim stack that's gonna be right around 76 to 77 thousandths. The single greatest tool ever made, I think.
right, make sure you got enough pinion threads exposed so you don't pull anything. I actually don't like that yet. These pinion bearings are tight on this outer. I did emery cloth it. Could have got a little more aggressive just to give it a little bit more tolerance. I actually have a solid spacer in here already, so I'm kind of free to tighten that nut up. We do set the pinion pretty loose in these as well because they hold very little oil and it's high pinion. And when you start going to like a 529 ratio, talked about before, that ring gear gets real thick and it starts to cover up some of the oil flow positions. It also takes up more mass where oil was before and so like i was talking about on the rear you do need to be careful with these pinion bearings because you got a colorado customer brand new diff and he gets it in the winter time he pops on the highway in four-wheel drive and now he's got 529 gears at 80 miles an hour and this thing does not oil great also when they do diff drops it will change the angle and that impacts oil flow so definitely don't want any slop in and out movement but do not want to get crazy on uh, these pinion bearings five inch pounds 10 at most and again i'm not sure what the book calls for stopped reading those a while ago and just from learned experience such as people full drive high speed 529s diff drop which is a lot of our customers to be fair as long as these bearings are nice and preloaded which if you've got five inch pounds on it, 10 inch pounds, that's great. The spec in the book is probably 12 to 15. We can check it, but we like to set these in the five to 10 range. So the pinion's back in. I've made a 3000 uh, adjustment, which to talk about the pattern, this coast side, I would say is more than two thou, but the drive side is not far off. And so what I'm concerned about is that I'm gonna go shallow on the drive to try to correct this coast. I'm more concerned with the drive and so I don't want to shallow that drive. So I'm going to make it a little more shallow, but if it starts to go shallow and this stays deep, it's just the nature of the gear and we would leave it alone. So you got to feed the wires back through your little hole. Again, we're not seating the grommet. We're paying very close attention not to screw up our magnet. Grab my case half, my vent's pointing towards me. Nice and lined up. Just gonna snag a couple bolts. Once again, I'm gonna spin this pinion the whole time. We didn't change backlash. We did take a little pinion depth out, so actually my backlash should open up like a half thou, maybe quarter thou, because we drew the pinion back. But just to make sure my magnet is in the correct position, I'm going to always spin it. This battery pack takes a second to lock in. There it goes. There it goes. So we repainted the pattern, dropped it back in. Everything's spinning nice and smooth. We're going to get it to lock in. Churning the butter, churning the butter. I don't think a lot of people know that reference, train and Didn't unlock that time. Now that coast is looking pretty good. Drive looks pretty good. It could be a touch shallow. That's the difference between 3000s right there. And I said two, I should have stuck with two. I felt like the coast was pretty deep, which is why I was like, yeah, I'll take three. So the coast does look good now, but that drive to me has gone uh, just a touch shallow. Shallow meaning though, it's up on the face. It's up on the face. Yep. I mean, again, just a touch. We're splitting hairs at this point, 1000 difference between 3000. <laughs> So started at 79, I'm at 76, 77 is the magic number. However, we are so close right now that backlash can have some to do with it. I will say by feeling it and we'll put this back in, we'll flip it over, we'll check the backlash. 
but this differential it doesn't have a whole lot of backlash six seven thou is where it's at i would assume but we'll put our gauge on it so we could go back to that 77 78 and maybe open the backlash up a touch to really dial in this pattern but for all intents and purposes we're right there where we need to be within a thou and in my opinion one thousandths starts to become a matter of opinion if you had this pattern i would be happy with it and go ahead and put it together or add a thou to it all right so we've made our opinion adjustment we know we're really really close on the pattern maybe we'll change it a thou now i'm concerned with exact backlash making sure we're doing what we think we're doing i've got all the bolts in now because i want to make sure there's no variables we're now checking backlash my pinion depth is all but there and so i'll show you how we do this which is a little bit interesting so we have a plate that bolts on and we'll hold our dial indicator again this is the oil drain hole here and you can see the ring gear right through there so this is about the only place that you can access backlash. This is what's known as a lever style dial indicator versus the one we were using on the rear is a push rod. So it goes up and down where this goes back and forth. So we've got to thread this needle down in here, put it on the gear and rock it back and forth to get a gauge for where our backlash is. Now, the tricky part is, is how do we move the carrier? Well, we've put some pretty good carrier bearing preload on this thing. So I can't even reach in there with my finger and move it back and forth because I've got those bearings loaded up, but my pinion's nice and smooth. I can feel and hear the backlash in it. So now this is gonna tell us exactly what it is. And this takes a little bit of finagling to get it just right. I think maybe they make some of these that have a longer needle on it, which would be pretty helpful and certainly make it easier for you guys to see. Sitting right there on the face of the tooth, I'm gonna wiggle the pinion just a little bit there so we see it. But how do we move the ring gear, which is another one of our super special service tools where we've taken a stub shaft, we've milled it out, and this one is specific to the Harrop because it's got this four-way cross pin, which again is very strong, but very much in my way most of the time because our other tools don't fit this. So uh, you just put this four-way in here and we're gonna engage all of those cross pins. There we go, we're locked in. So this is reading in half thou increments. So each hash mark is a half. So coming back from zero is a half, one, one and a half, we'll call that negative two. And then you'll see we're going to come past five to basically five and a half. So we got negative two and five and a half. We're at seven and a half backlash. So we're going to rock it back and forth, back and forth. If you have the right setup, it's not too bad to check these. But getting here is definitely interesting. And when you take into account open carrier A or B, Eaton E locker, there's all those idiosyncrasies that you kind of have to figure out these special tricks to check backlash correctly and get in there. So if someone didn't have a special tool like you guys made, you couldn't do it from here like this? Uh, so you can. So what we calculated seven and a half. There's a couple different ways. You can check it at the pinion and the pinion reads double. So if this is seven and a half, this should read 15. So you could rock this back and forth, but then you have to know that the value needs to be doubled. I've got a little bolt nut combination here and we can swap over to my push style dial indicator. I haven't necessarily done it this way, but I should be able to make this work. Now, this isn't nearly as accurate if you get a good position on the flat of the bolt, but if you're at a weird angle and it's kind of doing a side read on this, then your backlash measurement isn't gonna be very accurate doing it this way. I feel like I got a pretty good position. My ball is flat to the flat, and we're only reading a small amount. That's kind of convenient that it's about on zero. So I'll get it on zero for us so it should be easy to read. And then let's see where we go. Uh, that is reading 18. So these are 1,000 hash marks. And so zero past 90, it's read 82 to zero. So 82,000 zero, 82,000 zero. 
So 18, so divided by 18 is nine. Measuring at the pinion, it says we have nine thousandths backlash. Measuring with what I feel is a slightly more accurate way, you got seven and a half. Either way, within range, and I feel real good about our backlash, and I'm gonna leave it where it is. I'm gonna make a one thousandths pinion adjustment and call it a day. All right, so last assembly, and we'll kind of just wrap it up here, but we put all the bolts in so that we could check backlash to make sure that there wasn't any variables. Everything was seated. We still haven't put the grommet all the way through the case because we're still pulling this thing apart, but I am gonna show you now kind of how we do that. Because again, it's a little tricky. There's not a ton of room to work. So if you place yourself just like this, and I'm not gonna do it yet because I am gonna pull this diff back apart again, but you're gonna put RTV all over this surface right here push your wires through get your grommet kind of started by hand and then we use those little round needle nose pliers and you grab it right here and then you can use the ring gear as something to kind of help you push and just kind of work it from both ways and there you have it so we're in there and this is why we were checking all this stuff and making sure clearance but if you look i just kind of dropped it in there if you come around this side it's propped up on the magnet sitting on that thing but our tabs are lined up and so now all we got to do is finish that final drop and we got it so with the type of rtv are you using the red stuff that you use for differentials uh, we actually have like our own rtv that's made in a caulk tube by uh, Corning Chemicals. And so it's specially formulated. It's very similar to the Toyota stuff. And same as like Toyota, it's their own spec RTV. So we got with a company that makes RTV. I said, this is what we're doing. You know, we seal gaskets, diff covers, and it's gear oil. Posi additives and synthetics can leak quicker, particularly posi additives. So we kind of gave them a list of all the chemicals that it would see heat ranges, that sort of stuff. And it's like, you know, what's the best shit you make? I want cases of it. So, you know, we got a caulk gun. Everybody's got their own caulk gun and their own tube RTV. That's what we use. And if we use little squeeze tubes, we'd need thousands of those things a year. So the caulk gun, put a 45 on it and you can do like a real good bead on a diff cover or something. Kind of a lot easier than the squeeze tube. Speaking of RTV, now that got the ring gear back in there we're 100 percent sure the magnet is not bound up then we're going to reseal this obviously you're going to want to clean all this with uh brake clean we've already gotten the rtv off of there and we just run a bead right here in this corner and you see this lip so the lip pilots right here that's what i was talking to earlier like these are very very easy to seal because of this lip and this recess and how it pilots so you don't need a ton of rtv just go right in this little 45 degree, 90 degree angle here. And then as you compress it, it'll kind of ooze out and uh, be a nice even thread for you. I almost think you could put one of these together without RTV and it wouldn't leak because of this pilot and these two machine surfaces. You don't need a million gallons of RTV to seal these things and they work great. That pretty much finishes it up. You know, we never put a pinion seal in on this one, but make sure it is recessed. I will show you this tool. So we have a tool that has that step on it. So that will bottom out on the housing here and set the depth on the pinion seal. Again, like I said yesterday with the rear, you could use the outer pinion race to knock in that seal. Just flip it over, use it. Just make sure you're recessing it far enough. You can watch that rust line in the housing to really know what that depth was if you didn't measure it before you took it out. I want to say it's about 170 thou is that depth, but you know, when you pull your pinion yoke off, you can measure it. And again, just making sure that you're not getting any drag or rub here. Hopefully you got a really good idea on how to put these Eaton e-lockers in. This is the seven and a half. The eight inch clamshell is very similar. The grinding procedure is a little bit different, but same basic principles. And we gave you a good overview of what's happening how to drill the hole, how to clearance, how it locks and unlocks so that if you do go to put one of these in by yourself, you've got a really good shot at getting it in there without damaging it. 
And like I said before, if you're gonna build your very first differential, I would not do this one. Pick another one like a nine inch or you know a Toyota rear with side adjusters. But if you have tech questions, you need parts, or if you wanna buy complete diffs ready to go, give us a call. We're more than willing to give you tech support and help you on the parts side. That's what we do and that's what we know. So we can read pattern pictures for you, whatever you need, that if you do wanna tackle this yourself, be expected to be patient. Be patient, take your time, really pay attention, ask the questions, and know that this might take a, a week or two weeks when you have time to work on it, but that you're really paying attention and you're not trying to rush through it. Because for me, rushing through something like this with this much money at stake and all the effort of pulling the diffs in and out and those sort of things, you just want to make sure it's done right the first time you put it in the lockers are tested all that stuff and you're ready to go once you put gear oil in it really appreciate you guys coming to our facility taking the time to tour it really enjoyed myself and I'd like to come out four wheel with you guys to run some toyotas i'll sit in the passenger seat all right we are all done with this job i like east coast gear supply before we even made this trip and now i like them even more we actually had Chase Perry, the CEO of this company, started it from ground zero and built it to where it is today. And he spent basically two full days with us to give you guys all this great tech information so you could be successful if you choose to do your own differential rebuilds, re-gears, and locker installs. So I can't say it enough, thank you Chase, for giving us this much time and being generous with the do-it-yourself community to help them out. We're all enthusiasts here too, and obviously we like to work on our own stuff. And so we are very much an either-or company. If you wanna buy parts, buy the parts and we'll help you get them installed. Just be patient. If you just wanna buy diffs and get a warranty and know that they're right, call us up, we'll get you hooked up. I really enjoyed it. Next time you're doing the work and I'm watching. So. <laughs> All right. All right. So thank you for watching Toyota Time with Timmy the Tool Man and Sean and very helpful help for Ton and Chase Perry, CEO of East Coast Gear Supply. Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. If you have any questions or comments, do that below. Take care. Bye bye. Sick mods and sick differential rebuilds. Peace out. Happy wrenching. Bye bye.